Well, it is good to see all of you here this evening, and I hope and pray that you have had a marvelous day. God has blessed us with sunshine and rain, and my, what a blessing it is, and uh, I think about a blessing of being here tonight. Man, hasn't the singing been wonderful? Throughout every service, the singing has just been superb. You know, when I think of the White House congregation, I, I think of many things, and one of those things is when I think about the great singing, uh, not only the July singing, but the singing throughout the entirety of the year. And Am I doing something wrong here? Okay. We'll see. Well, I'm knocking it around or something. Okay. I believe that's better. Yes, okay, we've got it fixed. Uh, technology is technology, isn't it? <laughs> Thank God for it. But it is good to see all of you here tonight. The meal was absolutely delicious. I tried to eat as much as I could. I failed miserably, but, you know, I, I'll, I'll give it another shot on Thursday night, I promise you. I'll be ready for then, but it was absolutely delicious. And uh, if you had anything to do with it, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, just good to be here tonight. And Harrison, thank you for that beautiful prayer. Uh, Harrison is, is our youth minister at the Winfield Congregation, and we are truly blessed. He is uh, a fine, fine Christian man. I've had 13 youth ministers through the years, and they've all been wonderful. I've loved every one of them, and Harrison is by far one of the absolute best. And I'm proud that he is here. God bless you, and we love you sincerely. But well, this evening, folks, as we get into our Bible study, and that's what we're here for, we, we consider some of the most important things in all the world. Uh, for we consider the word gospel. And that word gospel is a very powerful word because we understand that it means good news. It's not bad news or badgering news or browbeating news. No, it's good news because... Well, we understand the world needs some good news, and the greatest news of all is the news of Jesus and salvation through him. And as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, Paul, in a very powerful way, he made it clear that the gospel was defined in, well, crystal clarity. Uh, Moreover, brethren, he said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I delivered unto you. Uh, for I delivered unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And there we find the word gospel, meaning good news, and, and we certainly understand encapsulated within that tremendously important word are those three principles that we find contained within those verse, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what will save the world. And if you're in a saved condition this evening, you understand the importance of the gospel. And as we consider the gospel, we understand just how important it is not only to the world because we need to be taking the gospel to the world. And sometimes the world is in our own neighborhood or our next door neighbor it could be right in our home that's where we need to start and work onward and outward because we've got to take the gospel preach the gospel go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature well as we understand the importance of taking it and preaching it folks it's also important vitally important to live it to, to live it daily to take up the cross of Jesus Christ and, and to bear it, to, 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 to carry it with us wherever we go, whomever we're with, whatever we're doing. And what a blessing it is when we're able to take the gospel to the people that we love and that we encounter from day to day, never being ashamed of it because it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And, and then in verse number 17 of Romans chapter 1, Paul made it perfectly clear. He said, for therein, that is, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So we go into the gospel 
the death, burial, and resurrection message of Jesus, and there we find everything that is right about God. He reaches back to the Old Testament when he quoted, quotes Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. He said, the just shall live by faith, and I pray that's how we're living today. We're living by the faith of the one who loved us and gave himself for us, is what Paul said, Galatians 2 and verse number 20. But this evening, I want to talk about the gospel in five seconds. Someone said it's going to be a short lesson. <laughs> in fact, a few years ago, uh, you know that time period between Bible class and worship on Sunday morning, that 10 to 15 minutes and everything? And I was, I was entering into the auditorium in Decatur, and uh, little fella, Rooney was his name. I, I don't even know. That was his nickname. I don't even know his real name. Rooney came up to me. He was about 9 or 10 at that time. He said, Preacher, what you preaching about today? And I said, about five seconds. And he looked at me with the most disbelieving look on his face and shook his head. He said, uh-uh. He said, you're a preacher. You can't do that. <laughs> it almost hurt my feelings. <laughs> but I got over it. And You see, he was thinking about time intervals, uh, clicks on a clock. Uh, second one, two, three, a time he was thinking. But tonight as we talk about the gospel in five seconds, we're not talking about uh, increments of time. I, I want to talk about things that are consecutive in nature. A couple of examples. When you go to the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, there Paul is talking about the great resurrection, not only of Jesus, but our resurrection as well. And he employs the illustration of what he calls in verses 45 and 47, the first Adam. Remember, he talks about the first Adam, and he says, this is the earthly Adam. And then he goes on down in verse number 47, and he says, but there is a second Adam. And he said, that second is Christ. When we love God, we understand that we must hold nothing back, right? We love God with everything that we've got. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 20, 22, and there in the verse, he was asked, uh, what is the, the, the greatest commandment in the law? And he, he answered right, and he answered well. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. In other words, love him completely. And, and then he said in the, the second, is like unto it. Remember what the second greatest command is? Love your neighbor as yourself. That was the second. He wasn't talking about seconds on clock or increments of time. He was talking about not the first, but the second. So this evening, the gospel in five seconds. This sermon is not original with me. This sermon was first written in the month of July in 1963 by two men, one by the name of Gus Nichols and the other one by the name of Glenn Posey. And I have the original handwritten gospel sermon. Brother Nichols wrote it and you can hardly read it. His handwriting was not the best in the world, but, but I cherish that, that Dad and Brother Nichols collaborated together and a couple of years later, Dad, Dad he came out with a sermon and called, uh, he called it the gospel in seven seconds where he added the second Adam and the second greatest command. And So, so this is just a repeat of, of yesteryear, but I believe it's timeless in its need. The gospel in five seconds. First of all, we understand the gospel, number one, is contained in a second law. The gospel is contained in a second law. Hebrews chapter 8, 6, and 7, very powerful. He is the mediator of a, a better covenant established on better promises, he says. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then there would have been no place sought for the second. We live under the second law as the Bible describes it. Hebrews 10 and verse number 9, He taketh away the first that he might establish the second we have our great Bible, and there is uh, 66 books in that volume, is there not? 
And yet there is one great division with two great sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Jesus made it very clear there in Matthew 5 and verse 17. He said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. No, I did not come to destroy, but I came to fulfill. And yes, in Jesus' life and his words and his teachings and everything that he did, he filled full all the prophecies of the prophets and the laws of the lawgivers. And oh, oh, he made it meaningful because he lived it like no other has lived it. And how did he do that? Well, Colossians 2 and verse number 14 is very clear because there we're told that Jesus nailed it. That is the old covenant. He nailed it to the cross. And let me just say as a sidebar, folks, if Jesus nailed it to the cross and left the old covenant there, should not we leave the old covenant there as well? When we think about what happened in John chapter 1 and verse number 17, as John is revealing that, he said, with Moses came the law, but with Jesus he brought grace and truth. So that we read in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 2, there in a very powerful way, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law. Of Christ. Isn't it wonderful to live under the law of the Son of God? Oh, yes, we appreciate and we learn from the Old Testament. It's for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. But, folks, today we live under the new covenant. We live under the law of Christ, and, and so therefore we give it honor by our words and our deeds and, and our thoughts. The gospel in five seconds. First of all, the gospel is contained in a second law. Secondly, this evening, I want you to consider the fact that not only do we see the gospel contained in a second law, but number two, the, the, the gospel commands a second birth. The gospel commands a second birth. Oh, I hope the next time you have a little time, you'll read through John chapter 3. And, and here's another homework assignment, if you don't mind. I hope you studied Genesis 22 last night and read it and saw it there. Tonight, here's the assignment for tonight. Read John chapter 3 and find every time the word must is used in that great chapter four times. And, and you'll see how that word is kind of just laid out for you to understand that chapter even better. Well, when we go to John chapter 3, in verse number 7, that, there Jesus said, Marvel not that I say unto you that you must be born again. There it is. Now, he had already encountered that man in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, named Nicodemus. He is a man. His name is Nicodemus. He is a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews, and he comes to Jesus by night. Now, those are the facts. And yet we're introduced to that guy, and he's a very interesting guy. Oh, his name, Nicodemus, that is a, oh, that's a good Greek name. And I've been looking around tonight, and uh, I watched you as you came in, you know. And I was looking. I've only seen one person with it here tonight. Only one person. Uh, that word Nicodemus, it's a compound word. The first part of the word is nikos. The second part of the word demos. That first part of the word, Nikos, uh, I, I think, Harrison, you're the only one with it tonight. Harrison is wearing a shirt, and on his shirt, there's a little check mark. When you see tennis shoes or shirts or sporting equipment with a little check mark on it, you, you know what brand that is, don't you? That's Nike. <laughs> you see, that's the word, Nikos in the name Nicodemus. And the word demos means people are gathering or a group. And so the word Nicodemus or the name Nicodemus means a, it really means just a victorious people and it's translated so often as overcomer or conqueror or one that wins. And in the book of Revelation it's used again and again and again to describe what we can have and what we have in Jesus. And here this guy comes to Jesus by night. Now, folks, I'll tell you right off the outset, I don't know why he came to Jesus by night. The Bible just doesn't tell us. Some believe that uh, he came to Jesus by night because at night Jesus would have finished his activities and, and, and he would be more readily available for a discussion. I don't know. 
Uh, others believe that it had something to do with the Passover week and, and night was better. Once again, I, I don't know. Still others say, well, he didn't want anybody to see him going to Jesus, so he came under the cloak of darkness. Once again, I, I don't know. The Bible never tells us, does it? But I know that we do see in the Gospel of John uh, as John develops the theme throughout the entirety of the gospel of the difference between light and darkness. Again and again and again he talks about darkness and, and then he, he, he contrasts it with light. And Nicodemus certainly illustrates that because in John chapter 3 he comes to Jesus at night. John chapter 7 He's coming out of the light a little bit because he's defending Jesus. But by the time you get to John 19, he's in the light because he's helping Joseph of Arimathea attend to the body of Jesus while taking him down from the cross. It could be that we just see an illustration of someone that goes from what's wrong to what's right. And we know that Nicodemus was not by himself. Sometimes people think that Jesus... Talk to Nicodemus and Nicodemus only. But notice in verse number 2, the pronoun. Uh, Nicodemus calls Jesus rabbi and he says, Rabbi, we. We know that thou art a teacher sent from God. We. Whether there were people standing beside him or around him or behind him or he was the representative, the spokesman from, from a group, that we know that they were those that were seeking Jesus. And that's when in verse number 3, Jesus he, he, he lowers the boom. He, he gives him the information. He helps Nicodemus in what he is seeking. Verse number 3, except you be born again, except a man be born again, he'll not see the kingdom of God. That's why in verse number 7 he says, Don't marvel at this that I say unto you that you must be born again. And, and yet when we think about being born again, Nicodemus, he understood it at least out of his own learning at how he had been raised and well, a, a Jew, a, a Jew became a Jew, or a Jew was born physically into Judaism. Nicodemus had a Jew daddy, had a Jew mama, and when Nicodemus was born and they gave him the name Nicodemus, he was a Jew because his daddy and mama were Jews. He came into Judaism by physical birth, and so that's what he says to Jesus, can a man, when he is old, enter again to his mother's womb and be born again? Oh, no, 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 Nicodemus, no. We're not talking about a physical birth because you see in verse number 3 when Jesus said, except a man be born again. That word again, if you don't mind writing in your Bible or maybe, maybe just making a note, that word again is pivotal. Because the word again means from above. It's not a physical, earthly, temporary birth. No, it's from Above, you see, you see, you must be born from above, a spiritual birth. It's a birth from within, not a birth of a physical nature. Because if you're not born again, you'll not see the kingdom of God. Now, if there was still any confusion in the heart and the mind of Nicodemus, when Jesus comes to verse number five, he clears it up completely. When he says, Except a man be born of water and the spirit, he'll not enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was pointing Nicodemus to a time when the kingdom would exist and the entrance would be possible. To enter into the kingdom was only by a spiritual birth. You must be born again. And the born again means to be born of water and the spirit. The water there pointing to the time of Acts chapter 2 when on that day those that gladly received the word of Peter and the other apostles, they were baptized and they were added to them about 3,000 souls. He was pointing to the time when the transition in their life would take place when they were united with Christ in baptism. But it was also of the Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit. It, it's, it's the spiritual existence that came within that transformation. What a blessing it is to understand that spiritual birth is so powerful. Peter would put it this way, 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, or we've been born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, then he talks about that inheritance. He said, to an inheritance that is 
that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. He, he said we've been born again so that we can have a living hope and that living hope is by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead so that we can inherit heaven. James 1 and verse number 18 is a powerful passage. In fact, when we read that passage, we can't read verse 18 without looking at verse number 17. We're, we're there. James tells us about the blessings and the benefits that come from God. Uh, listen to James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Folks, if you got anything good and, and perfect, anything good and right in your life today, who, who do we have to thank for it? Well, I'm going to thank God. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. So everything comes from God, and thank God for that. But then in verse number 18, he says this, Of his own will, that is, of God's own will, it's God's will, of his own will begot he us. That is, we have been born again. He said, begot he us by the word of truth that we should be or become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I love that. Oh, man, that is incredible. You, you see, James reaches back into the Old Testament and he grabs there that understanding of the principle of first fruits. We know it, don't we? You have the, the harvest. And when you bring it in, will you take the first and you take the best and who do you give it to? You dedicate it to God. Thank you, God. You see, that's what God wants us to become. When we're born again, we're born of the will of God, it says in that passage. What a marvelous and glorious gift that truly is. But he wants us then to become Something in that, that chapter of James 1, we see several indications of what he wants us to become. Verse number 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and all the residue of immorality and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Folks, let me tell you this evening, God wants us to be people of the book. I pray that your daily schedule includes a generous Feasting upon the holy word of God. But not only does he want us to know his word, uh, listen to verse number 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and seeth what manner of man he was and then turneth away, he forgetteth what manner of man he was and... Folks, we, we, we need to be not only hearers of the word, that is the people of the book, but we've got to be doers of the book as well. Verse number 25 tells us another aspect of that. Uh, notice in verse 25. But, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in what he does. God wants us to become people of the book to become doers of the word, to become blessed individuals within his kingdom. But then, well, here it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit sometimes on the tough side. Because he says in verse number 26, we've got to control our tongue. And that's tough for some folks. They don't think they can do it. They even say, I, I just tell it like it is. I just let the chips fall where they may. I'm not going to apologize to anybody. Really? <laughs> Listen to what James says. If any man among you seemeth to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is King James uses the word vain, and the word vain means worthless. God wants us to be people of the book. He wants us to be doers of the word. He wants us to be blessed in his kingdom, and he wants us to control our tongue, but he also wants us to be servants for those that we encounter. Listen to verse 27. 
pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. There's a lot of people hurting in our world, aren't they? The greatest humanitarian organization that exists on the face of this earth to help those that are in need is the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because you see, the church offers more than just tangible help. It offers more than just physical assistance. It offers spiritual transformation. The greatest need that is in existence today. So when, when we're told that the gospel commands a second birth, folks, we're talking more than just being babes in Christ. We're talking about that desire of the sincere milk of the word that grows and flourishes and, and becomes everything that God wants us to become. The gospel in five seconds. The gospel is contained in a second law. The gospel commands a second birth. But number three, the gospel promises a second coming. The gospel promises a second coming. Uh, Hebrews 9, verses 27 and 28. We know it, don't we? Uh, and as it is appointed that the man wants to die, and after that the judgment, we, we know that, don't we? That, that is a reality, an appointment we must all encounter. So Christ, he says in verse 28, so Christ, so Christ was once offered for the sins of many they that who look for him, he shall appear, it says, a second time. He shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's coming back. He's coming back. Thank God he's coming back. He didn't leave us here all alone. He didn't abandon us. He's coming back. And, and yet we do not know the day when that will be. So therefore we must be prepared for when he arrives. You know, <laughs> you, might, you might give me an invitation. And, and if you did give me an invitation to come over to your house and have a meal, I, I, well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. But Brother Posey, we want to invite you over to our house and we're going to have T-bone steaks and baked potatoes. You know what I would say? I'm ready. Tell me when. I'm ready. I might return the favor and say, I'd like to have you over to our house to have potty meat and buy any sausages. And, and you know, you might say, you know, in return, I'm ready. <laughs> Folks, isn't it important that we can say every day of our life, I'm ready. It doesn't matter when the day is. That is, it could be on a Tuesday. I'm ready. And the importance of being ready is typified when we read in Matthew 24, verses 42 and 44. There Jesus in a very clear way, clear way says, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Why? He's coming back. He's coming back to get us. Let's be ready when that occurs. He promises that in John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 6. For in the earlier chapter, that is chapter 13, he tells his disciples who had been with him, had, had walked with him, that had listened to him, that had, that had shared with him and cooperated with him, that they had spent all of their time with him. I mean, he was their life. And he tells them in chapter 13, I'm leaving. Which helps me to understand why in verse number 1 he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, For in my Father's house there are many mansions. Uh, that, that is, there is room enough for all. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again 
and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. Thomas, he, Lord, we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way? In verse number 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's coming back. And the most important thing in regard to the second coming of Jesus is preparation. Folks, on that day, it will not matter what we did for a living. It will not matter where we lived. It will not matter what we drove. It will not matter how much we had or did not have. It will not matter where we were able to spend vacation. It will not matter. The only thing that will matter on that day, am I right in the sight of God? The gospel in five seconds. The gospel is contained in a second law. The gospel commands a second birth. The gospel promises a second coming and then number four. And, and, and yes, number four, the gospel warns of a second death. Now we understand the Bible is full of encouragement the Bible also contains warnings, doesn't it? Now we as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and, and all of that, we, we understand that. Those children, those grandchildren, those nieces and nephews, well, we understand. I love you, baby. I love you, baby. But, but don't touch that hot stove. Don't run out in the street. Don't get away so I can't find you. And why do we do that? Because we love them. And, and yet... Why does God warn us? I believe he warns us because he loves us. And the Bible warns of a, a second death. James 2 and verse number 26 speaks about death in that, that great section that speaks about living faith. And there in the last verse of the chapter, he, he says, For the body without the spirit is dead, even so faith without works is dead also because it's alone. It's alone. And the emphasis there is this. Now, now as, as under Judaism, if you touched a dead body, that would make you unclean. And so James is saying just like you don't need to touch or get near or get around a dead body, don't you get around or touch dead faith. You stay away from dead faith. Your faith needs to be dynamic. It needs to be alive. It needs to be the kind of faith that demonstrates what you believe. You, 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 you want to see, see faith without works? Well, I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll live it for you. I'll speak it for you. I'll, I'll be a living demonstration of it. But yet death is a reality, isn't it? I've, I've, been, I've enjoyed through the years saturating myself in the book of Revelation. I've been blessed to teach it in so many places. I just finished teaching Revelation in the adult Bible class at Winfield, and I'm teaching it in Athens at the School of Bible Emphasis. I just finished teaching it down at the Gus Nichols School of Biblical Studies. I, I've taught it in the International Christian College. At, um, I, I've taught it at Bear Valley Bible Institute. I've taught it at Faulkner University. And I'm writing about it for Heritage Christian University. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak about it at the upcoming Fried Hardeman Lectures. I've just been saturated in it. And it's an amazing book. Oh. I know that they were suffering. They were under so much pressure. And they even lost their lives. And so in chapter 6, 9 through 11, they cry out to God and they say, God, how long will we, be go, will we go unvindicated? How long will it be before you, 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 you vindicate us? And God said, wait. Chapter 19, verse number 3, he said, you have been vindicated. In, in chapter 14, we see the 144,000, which represents the, the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and they're standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. They're standing victoriously. And, and, and then we see the dragon. That old devil, he's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Then we see the sea beast. 
There's the emperor of Rome. He's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. We see the false prophet. He's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And Babylon, that great prostitute, the harlot as it's described, uh, the smoke from the destruction billows up forever from, from the fact that God said, I will not tolerate. I will not tolerate persecution against my faithful. You come to chapter 20 and verse number 11 and there is where all of those that have given their allegiance to the beast, that wear his mark, that worship his image, they're judged. And you begin in verse number 11 of chapter 20 and this is what you find. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And then, then you read this. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. He says, this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, verse 15, was cast into the lake of fire. All of those that gave their allegiance to the devil and to the beast and to the false prophet, all of them that wore the mark of the beast, all of them that worship the image, they're judged. That second death is a serious matter. You know, for those that are victorious in Jesus, those that are overcomers, those that are conquerors, those that ride with the victorious lamb. Well, you go back up to verse number 6 and you read there in chapter 20. Blessed and holy is the one that hath part in the first resurrection over which the second, de the second death hath no power. See, folks, if you're a Christian here this evening, you've experienced the first resurrection. You, like in Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 and 4, you died to your old way of life and you were buried in the watery grave of baptism where God applied the blood of his son to your soul and your sins were washed away. And then you were resurrected into all things that are new. Newness of life. There's the first resurrection. If you're a Christian here tonight, you've experienced the first resurrection. Revelation 20 verse 6 says, The second death has no power over you. Paul to the Thessalonians in a very powerful way said, chapter 1 and verses 7 through 9, he said, when, he said, when you're troubled, he said, to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall descend from heaven, when she, he shall be revealed and descend from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that, you know, folks, when we think about vengeance, you know, some people, they, 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 think, that, they think that here on this earth that we need that we need to be in the revenge business. Christians aren't in the revenge business. We're not in the business to get even with people that do things against us. Remember Romans 12? Paul quotes a very powerful passage and he, he says, The Lord said, Vengeance is mine, saith the, the Lord. I don't have to worry about ever thinking about getting even with someone. God's got that department taken care of. And he says there in that Second Thessalonian passage, he, he tells them he's going to take vengeance on them that, number one, know not God, and, and the number two, that know not the gospel, that obey not the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting punishment from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power and that, that just that breaks my heart folks I don't want anyone to go to hell and so we as Christians we, we strive to say the right things 
We strive to think the right things and we strive to do the right things, praying and hoping to be an example or an influence that others will see so that they can, they can be obedient to Jesus. Because the gospel in five seconds says that the, the gospel is contained in a second law. It commands a second birth. It promises a second coming, but it warns of a second death. And finally this evening, the gospel provides for a second law of pardon. A second law of pardon? What does that mean? Do you remember the prophet Jonah? And that's a story right there, isn't it? Boy, I, that's a page turner. Uh, God told him, go preach. Even gave him the location. He said, you go preach to the Assyrians. The capital city in Assyria was Nineveh. Oh, Jonah had experience. He had a pass with those Assyrians. Oh, the Assyrians, oh man, they were mean. They were rascals. They were hateful. They, they were mean as an old junkyard dog. That's how mean they were. They didn't value life or care about anything. And Jonah knew that. He didn't want to go preach to them. So what did he do? He went in the opposite direction of what God commanded him to do. And he got up. You know, folks, when anybody runs from the, the commands of God, doesn't the devil always have the boat waiting? He got on that boat and out in that sea there, the, the, the waves were going. Oh, I don't even want to get sick by thinking about that, that storm. Just back and forth and back and forth. And Jonah says, I'm the reason. Pitch me over and the storm will cease. Man, that would have been a burden to carry. You want us to pitch you over the side in this storm. But man, well, that's too much to ask of anybody, but... I guess the storm prevailed, did it not? They, they pitched him in the water. What was it that swallowed him? Now, now in, in Jonah, we're told a, a, a great fish or a big fish. Jesus calls it a whale. Whatever it was, it was, it was capable of swallowing a man whole. I, you know, and I've often thought about what was it like down there? <laughs> we know he was conscious, don't we? Yeah. And I've often wondered, you know, what did it smell like? <laughs> uh, not, to make, not to be gross or anything, but what did he drink? How, how long was he in the, the belly of the great fish? Three days and three nights? Man, I'd get thirsty after a while, wouldn't you? Well, what did he eat? Well, folks, we're really not told all about that, but I know what he did while he was there on that three days and three nights vacation in the belly of the great fish. I know exactly what he did. Read chapter 2 of Jonah, and that's exactly what he did from beginning to end. What was he doing? He was praying. Man, I'd be praying like I'd never prayed before. And, and then we see, well, to add gross to grotesque or to gag a maggot as some might say now he is vomited out on dry ground boy don't you know that was an enjoyable experience <laughs> and Jonah 3 and verse 1 says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time let me ask you this evening have you ever got a second chance in your life at something I have isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you think about the, the second chances that we've had in life, the blessings of receiving that. I, Mark 16, there, there Jesus, uh, the, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they go and they head toward the tomb. Uh, they knew where Jesus was buried and there was a great stone in front of it. And that as they go, they, they ask, you know, who's going who's gonna to move the stone? And, and they get there early in the morning on the first day of the week. And when they get there, oh, the stone's been rolled away. And, and the text describes they go into the tomb and, and they see where he lay. They, see his they saw his clothes and, and, and there is a, a young man 
He's there. He's dressed in a white robe. And he says, why are you looking for Jesus? He's not here. He's risen. Then in verse number 7, this, this young, uh, the other gospel writers describe an angel. Verse 7, I love this. Go, tell the disciples and Peter that he goeth before thee. You'll be able to see him. He, he's going to Galilee. You'll be able to see him. And I've often wondered, why is Peter the only one that is named among the disciples to go and tell? Now... I don't know, but, but, but I kind of think it was because I think Peter needed a second chance. Oh, he had denied the Lord one time, hadn't he? I've even read that he denied him two times. And the Bible says he denied him how many? Three. If there was ever a person in this world that needed a second chance, I believe it was Peter. You go and tell the disciples and make sure you... You te the text says when Peter denied the Lord and he heard the rooster crow, he went out and wept bitterly. He was as low as a snake's belly in a wagon rut. That's how low he was. But the Lord saw in Peter someone that needed to get up and to preach that first gospel sermon and take it to the Gentile. It was later in Matthew 18 that Peter said, uh, how many times should we forgive? Remember, he offered a number. Seven times? You see, the rabbis of that time said, once you get to four, well, once you've forgiven a person four times, now this is the rabbinical, these are the rabbis, once you've forgiven four times, buddy, that's it. No more. Peter, he, he tacks on an extra three and I mean, very generous. And he said, seven times? And the Lord says, no, not seven times. Remember what he said? He said, you forgive 70 times seven. I, I don't really think that 490 is the cutoff point that Jesus was communicating. I believe that he was communicating a lifestyle. You just keep on forgiving you just forgive again and again and again. And after all, folks, how many times, let me ask you, how many times has God forgiven you? I thank him every morning, every night. God, thank you for forgiving me. Because, folks, sometimes, I don't know if you do, but sometimes I think the wrong thing. Do you? There's times I, I'll say the wrong thing. Have you ever done that? There's been times that I've done the wrong thing. Anybody here that way? Thank God for his forgiveness again and again and again. Simon is a, is, is a prime example. In Acts chapter 8, Simon, he, he heard the gospel message. Verse number 13, he became a Christian. Verse number 19, he sinned after becoming a Christian. And in verse number 21, well, there he's confronted about that sin. In verse number 22, he is told by Peter, he said, Repent and pray that God will forgive you. And, and folks, how many times have we thought the wrong thing, done the wrong thing, and said the wrong thing, and we said, God, please forgive us, and we know according to 1 John 1 and verse number 9, He does. We're a living demonstration of the blessings of God's forgiving Spirit. We are of all people most blessed. The gospel is contained in a second law. The gospel commands a second birth. The gospel promises a second coming. The gospel warns of a second death. And the gospel provides a second law of pardon. Tonight, while we have time, while we have opportunity, there is a need in anyone's life to ask God for forgiveness for a wrong that has been done or to begin the journey of living the life of Christ likeness 
There's no better time, no better opportunity than here tonight. What about obeying the gospel this evening? If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come? It's together we stand and as we sing.